Ready to go? Hi, good afternoon. My name is uh, Robert Johnson. I'm the president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and unlike the name card on my uh, seat there, I am not a professor, I must confess. But uh, I'm happy to be here with an extraordinary panel. It reflects a body of research that the Institute felt uh, was, how would I say, essential at a time when people are doubting the integrity and the legitimacy of expertise in the decision-making process in our politi political economies. My own sensibility after working to build the Institute for Neo Economic Thinking for 10 years is that uh, it is precisely at the times that are painful it is precisely at the times that are difficult when I would say resistance is strongest and when introspection is most necessary in order to what I might call resurrect the faith in and the use of expertise, which I think in our complex society is very necessary. So in that spirit, the idea of looking at ourselves, not pretending that we are in some kind of fantasy romantic meritocracy that defines itself, but rather we are people in a community which has an anthropology, which has a structure of incentives and evidence of how it organizes itself and belongs, and perhaps uh, a question of how this mechanism, we call the peer review journals, helps us to identify and promote excellent research and select excellent people. And on the other hand, the extent to which it is either stifling or refractory in its outcomes, not necessarily intending to be. But this, like I said, this introspection, this putting the flashlight on our own profession, I think is a very healthy thing to do to see if we can improve the alignment and the systems. And I will note, and then turn over to our speakers, that we are at a time when the technology for what you might call creating and debating and evaluating people, as we have in the peer review journals, has changed markedly with online technology. And I'll point to my friend Mike Eisen, who was one of the three co-founders of the Public Library of Science, which in the medical sciences is, uh, how you say, gone on a very different trajectory, which I think is somewhat more transparent and uh, in, in an interesting way to see the progress of ideas and information unfold. Let me uh, emphasize we're going to have three speakers all of whom have done very substantial research, about 13 minutes each is the ground rules we're hoping for. Uh, somebody's got to give me a big cane or something, but I don't have one of those. And then uh, thereafter we'll have three seven-minute commentators, discussants, and then we're trying to preserve a half an hour for an interaction with, uh, with everyone in the room. Let me first... Uh, introduce a person who I think played an enormous role in the kickoff at the American Social Science Association meeting in Chicago. What was it, almost three years ago now? 2017. Okay, uh, so a little over two years ago. Uh, Jim Heckman, Angus Deaton, George Akerloff, uh, Drew Fudenberg, and Lars Hansen, four of whom are Nobel laureates held a very, very vibrant session, which you can see uh, a footnote in Jim's paper has a link to it, and I know the INET website has that, but that energy is where it all began, and uh, Jim is sitting next to me talking about, let's, how do we go beyond this? But let's go to this first, and then we'll talk about that. Okay. Jim? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so I want to discuss the stated topic 
and I'm going to present uh, some evidence on the question about the influence of the, uh, of the top five. Uh, many of you are young, young scholars starting out, and I know I would guess that all of you are counting the number of top fives you have and hoping you'll have more. And so what this is is a study of whether your concerns are warranted and what the implications are for the current practice. So I'll talk about both of these things. I don't know if this works. Okay. So everybody knows the top five, I suspect, and we know what, what determines them. It's not really the quality of a particular article, it's the aggregate impact factor. And it's a really important uh, gateway to tenure. And I wanna talk a little bit, and I hope we'll talk it in the round table, about the implications of this practice in the, for the profession and what should be done about it. So let me just summarize. We did an extensive body. I should point out, by the way, I have a co-author, Siddharth Mokhtan, who will actually be a graduate student at London School of Economics this coming fall. So some of you from LSE, you should look out for him. He's very bright. So what we found, we looked at work history data on uh, professors, assistant professors, uh, and promotions for the last 10 or 15 years. It varies by sample. And we ask how tenure outcomes are, are influenced by top five publications. And we find that this concern that I think many people share it's empirically valid, uh, it, it, and we know that junior faculty are acutely aware of the top five strong uh, uh, po policies, uh, its effect on promotion. And I think it actually has a distortion on research, which we'll talk about in this session. But also, there is evidence, and there's earlier work by Dan Hammamesh that's consistent with this. We build on that and extend it, that even in terms of its own reference point, which is citation, uh, the top five is not a very adequate filter for research quality. So let me show you some data quickly. So we know that top five publications significantly increase the probability of tenure. They reduce the time to tenure, and it varies by department ranking. So here's an example, for example, of asking in the first tenured, untenured track of assistant professors, we have a whole set of models. The appendix has lots of sensitivity. I can't go through that now. But here, if you look at the impact of top fives, you can see one, two, three, it really raises the probability of tenure. And if you look at the other journals, and I won't list them, they are in the paper, tier A, tier B, tier C, and you can obviously interchange the contents, you get that the impact is far less. So there really is a powerful, powerful force here. And the probability of receiving tenure by the seventh year is similarly very well dependent on how many top fives you have. And you can also look at the hazard rates about the time to tenure and how this varies across departments. And there's a very powerful effect of top fives, even in ranked departments 11 through 20. And you can look at the time to tenure. And it's certainly true that if you have, uh, a top, if you have top five papers, the time to tenure is much, much shorter. So what do we know also about it? There is something from finding, it's a suggestive finding, that there are gender disparities in the probability of receiving tenure. And so, for example, this system, now this is not, the trouble is, and we know it's a debated issue for other sessions, that the number of women in the economics is quite small. So the number of women in our sample is relatively small. So we can't make a very precise statement about the difference, but you can see that the power of the top five is different between men and women, at least the point estimate. Uh, not statistically significant. Uh, we can argue the sample size probably plays a role. And so what did we do? We also took a survey of people, young people who are starting out. And uh, we actually went and got a fairly high response rate, 40% response rate, until we got a criticism from one person who felt that his identity would be, to, would be revealed. So we only had a 40% response rate and then we had to withdraw the survey because of this complaint to the IRB board. But nonetheless, if you see what assistant professors think is important, top five clearly is the big, big factor. Letters a little bit uh, you know, less important, non-type five even less important, citations less, teaching less, grants less, and books. Books just get thrown away and not being important sources of information. Uh, and you can also see how uh, this varies dramatically by department ranking. But there's no question that the top five plays a huge role. 
And what the junior faculty feel, is, this is just quotations from our survey. The paper is coming out in the, our paper is coming out in the Journal of Economic Literature with another paper by George Akerlof, who was also in that session that you mentioned. So this is, these are quotes just from the uh, assistant professors and some associate professors. And of course they said, look, I, it, I just changed my life. I was treated as a different human being. And uh, during my third year review, you know, and so forth and so on. So all these stories say, yes, when I got my first top five, I became a human being. And there is this deep sense that's out widely shared. I think probably many of you share it. So, but I will just show you what is really important, which is the top five is not really doing the job it's claiming to do. If you look at this distribution here, the solid lines are the top fives. You can see, for example, some of the other companion journals. The QJ is out there in terms of citation. So this is the residualized uh, distribution of citations, residualizing for exposure time of publication of the paper. And what you can see, though, is that uh, in, there are many so-called non-top five journals that really overlap and vie substantially with uh, other with journal the top five and with some of the so-called top five, the whole aggregate of top fives. Uh, so what's happened is I think we are, and this is something Card and Della Vigna made, professions growing and this, the acceptance rate is declining. So the filtering process is, is, is really, and we know there's, a, there's an information issue. We do truly want to filter people. So the acceptance rate, however, has gotten down to about 5%, which is discouraging, I guess, for everybody in this room, anybody. And if you look at field-specific journals, you'll find some kind of interesting difference. If you look at publications, it almost has to be this way in some sense, most of the work in these fields is outside the big five. But if you look at the journals that receive the highest citation in different fields, so the first slide is pretty automatic, the second isn't so much, and you'll see that in labor economics, the Journal of Labor Economics is more highly cited. And, and, and so it goes for many of these fields, Journal of Health Economics, in finance and so forth. So in IO, the RAND Journal. So there really is a serious question. And then to get to the issue that I think concerns us all, if you look at the turnover at the big five journals, there's an outlier, and I think everybody knows his name, so I'll let you guess what it is, but uh, if you don't, turn to your neighbor. Uh, but what you see is high turnover at the Review of Economic Studies. House journals like the QJE and the JPE have longer tenure length, much less turnover. AER has had some issues with turnover. And so what this means is that you are playing against the same group of people. It's not like you're, you, you have your chances. Uh, you do, but you really, in some journals, basically are playing with the same editors who have very strong preferences. And uh, we compute what we call incest coefficients, which is asking the question how much, you know, for example, look at Chicago, what's the percentage of coefficients that have work related, uh, of variables related to Chicago faculty, former students? It's about 14%. If you look, for example, at the Quarterly Journal of Economics, it won't shock anybody that, you know, 25% have a higher affiliation in some way or another, or in 33.7 have a, an affiliation with uh, Cambridge, MIT, and Harvard. So the incentives, I think, really reduce uh, research. They're focusing on what the top five editors want. And there's lots of discussion, we'll probably have more of it today, and I gotta pretty much stop in a second here. But it really, you know, incentivizing research. I had a very bright young woman many years ago now, she went on and had a good career. We talked about a, a topic that was really important, and she agreed it was very important, but she told me, and I was very saddened by it. Well, that's a great topic, but the trouble is, I don't think I can get it in the top five, and it's probably too long. It's gonna to be too long if I really synthesize all this research. And so what it led to was she never worked on this, and it was, it was very, very sad. So I think what it contributes, and that's what the session shows on the tape, people like Angus and uh, Lars and uh, George, everybody was talking about the fact that it literally, it, it incentivizes the next step. Maybe you want to call that normal science, but it also really emphasizes the trivial. And we know the lots of examples about Ackerlof's lemons, uh, Lucas's expectations of neutrality. 
the two by two by two model that was referred to in the presidential lecture here is another example of something that really got kicked around at the major journals. And really, when Akerlof published his paper, the QJE was very way down on the totem pole. So we really know from a lot of other research that innovation incentive schemes should tolerate really experimentation and failure. Uh, and those two aren't necessarily related, but somehow putting every through the temp template of getting top five journals and peer review is a very, very long, it's like going through the eye of a needle, very, very difficult. So let me just summarize. Top five is very important, and we know it is, and we're gonna talk about how important it is. It really changes the emphasis of the profession. Young people start out life, and in some cases they never end this habit. Once they get in the top five itis, they stay with top five the rest of their lives. We know that in terms of faculty decision making, and I've been in a lot of meetings and a lot of settings, not just at my own university, that people will literally count the number of top five papers. This is a good person. This person has six top fives in three years. Ah, must get tenure. This person has no top fives, death. And so it's a very, very, very serious issue. And it does, I think, because everybody's on this short clock, and, and this clock that routinizes, gets you into kind of a main, quote, mainstream research. It's serious. And there are documented studies where this has created a US-UK centricity. Literally, I work a lot in China these days, and a lot of the scholars in China aiming to publish in top five will work on the panel survey of income dynamics and the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth. Not because they don't have good data, China's getting really rich data, but because they know the top five wants, or at least they think they know the top five really wants to publish papers like that, because that's what they do. So let me just conclude with my proposal. We'll hear more. I think we should really make this a public document in the sense, this knowledge. We should really show how flawed the system is, what dangers it contains. Clearly, my overlap shows a broad list of journals that should be added, but that's not it. I think you really, one idea that you were hinting at, I think, is the notion of open source publication. And I think this has to be taken seriously. I think Viktor Chunazukov now, didn't he start a journal? It's, it's in Fudenberg, one of the participants. So it, we know that open access, it's totally different. What it does is that you put your paper out there and you immediately have put yourself at risk for pot shots and for somebody pointing out how stupid your paper is and so forth. But what it does is it speeds up the process of dissemination of ideas and the give and take, the background. And, so, and it doesn't restrict entry the way current systems do. So I really think that we want to think hard about the incentive systems we currently use and we'll learn more about it. Okay, thank you. I'll just plant the seed of a question for a little bit later. You've identified and measured the effect of the top five, but departments and research, exer research assessment exercises have to use those metrics as a guide to decision, and the question is why do they choose to use them? Perhaps they won't after they see your results, but, but there is some other process going on in the choice to use these measures as a, how do you say, indicator for tenure or for research grants. But don't you think it's just, in some fundamental sense, it's an easy signal. It solves an aggregation problem. We have all this, yes. reading a paper, it can be very, very hard, reading almost any paper. And if you're judging a person for tenure, it's gonna be a lot easier to say, this person has six top fives than to say, you know, page 33 contains a great idea and so forth and so on. Yeah. And I'll bring an American perspective as well because I've asked that question of a lot of deans. And the answer they give me is the threat of lawsuits when people are denied tenure is not an infrequent thing in the United States and having an objective measure that they can walk into the courtroom with makes a difference. Let's move on now. Uh, Sanjeev Goyal from Cambridge University who uh, has created a paper on the influence of the journals that began how do you say, at the second phase of, of the INET uh, inquiries and uh, how do you say, was self-inspired. So Sanjeev, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Rob. 
um, <clears throat> it's always uh, a daunting prospect to speak after, after Jim. Uh, this paper is uh, joint work with Lorenzo, Dr. Uh, Marco van der Leyen and Gustavo Paez. Uh, Gustavo is a former PhD student of mine from Cambridge, and we started this project uh, really last uh, December, and it really was provoked by the panel uh, that Jim and, and Rob uh, are sort of mentioning. And you will see in, in the talk today that some of the main uh, points that we are making and developing, empirically developing and theoretically developing, really were inspired uh, by the, the discussions uh, in that panel, especially uh, points made by Angus Deaton. Um, so, so I'm aware this is a 13 minute talk and I'm not going to go through slides as quickly as Jim uh, did. And today I think he was a lot slower than he normally is. <laughs> so I'm going to, let me see if I go through. Um, so this is uh, by way of background. I just want to say, if I don't have the time, um, that the point of this paper is to, um, uh, is the motivation is very similar. I, have, I was chair at the Cambridge Economics Faculty for four years. And uh, part of the, I think the main motivation for working on this came from sitting in tenure meetings and recruitment committees where, as Jim was saying, people were counting uh, beans, you know, rather than discussing ideas. And, and so it was uh, very disorienting initially. Um, the other thing I noticed is that people were looking at citations and um, it started slowly 10 years ago in Cambridge, but I think it is more and more the case that people look at citations. And in fact, they look at a number of different citation metrics. So, so that is the other thing that, that happened. And occasionally, I'm pleased to say that the faculty has overruled the top five in favor of citations. There are issues with citations, but I just wanted to flag this, that there is this um, possibility with senior, senior, senior economists. So um, many of you have probably seen this uh, short, uh, ironical sort of piece by Roberto Serrano. He calls it top five um, uh, Part of the other motivation for doing this paper came from that. I don't think Roberto is uh, quite right in saying that this focus on top five is a recent phenomenon. Uh, at least I personally, that's not been my experience. And you will see uh, that led us in this project to look very closely at the history of the uh, profession, really. When did the interest, when did the influence of top five emerge? Has it, is it really the case that top fives are unambiguously, unequivocally, really the five dominant journals? In what sense are they dominant? Um, and, and how long has this happened? When did this happen? Um, and then we want to understand why did it happen? Is this specific to economics? Did it happen in physics? Uh, is there something you know, we can learn from some other disciplines? Uh, so those are the kind of concerns that uh, 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 you know, we are going to look at in this paper. Um, so so the, this, these are the sort of... So the main thing I'll go through today is to give you, first of all, a, a, a picture of the history of uh, publishing in economics, history of the influence of journals, uh, we will have a, a basically a fairly complete uh, picture. Uh, we have all the econ lit journals. We have the web of science. So over the last 45 years, we have data on publishing and citations. So we should be able to get a pretty good idea of the evolution of influence. We will have a number of different measures. So we'll be able to tease out you know, possible tensions. Um, and then we will have a theoretical model to explain why is it that we see what we do see. Okay, so by now, I think um, uh, all of you are familiar with the top five. Uh, let me just say that some of the inspiration for what we are doing comes from a very nice paper by um, Glenn Ellison in the JPE, uh, where he looked at 16 journals, um, and we are going to use the same set of journals. He actually used 17 journals, but yeah, we, we, for some reasons we dropped one. So we're going to separate them into three categories, top five, the tier two, which is general interest journals, and top field journals. So it's five, three, and eight. Okay. Uh, we are going to look at 
uh, different ways of thinking about influence. We will look at, at the web of science, uh, but the web of science doesn't tell us um, you know, how often a, a paper that cites you is cited in turn. So if you want to look at more um, uh, sort of sophisticated measures of influence, which look at, give more weight to more cited papers that cite you, then we may want to look at a more complete sort of uh, set of uh, data. And that leads us to this 100 journals data set, which is a complete set. Okay, so, so I'm gonna start by doing uh, just very basic um, number crunching. I'm going to look at the impact factor, which is a very standard measure. This is simply looking, so this is, uh, the first equation tells you, um, this is the number of citations received by journals, by papers published um, in journal I in your T. Uh, so, so you'll see there is an S, that's the um, year in which the paper was published. T is the year in which the citations are being counted. Okay. So, and I'm normalizing by the number of papers, so that gives me the impact factor. And what I'm going to do is, following Ellison, I'm going to look at the ratio of the impact factor of a journal that we're interested in versus um, the impact factor of top fives. Okay. We will look at 10 year intervals, but we have done the same thing for three years, two years, five years, nothing much. Everything here is going to be very robust. So here's the big takeaway. This, if there's one picture you should take away from this talk, this is the picture. Um, so what is this picture telling us? On the x-axis, I have time. I'm starting in 1980 because I'm looking at papers which were published in the decade before 1980, so from 1970 to 80. How much were they cited in 1980? On the y-axis, so I'm just running a time series. On the y-axis, I'm looking at the um, relative um, citations of tier two and top field. And what we are seeing here is when you start in the 1970s, 80s, um, in fact, and, and you can look at specific journals like Journal of Economic Theory, for instance, they were essentially, in, in many cases, as influential, if not more influential, uh, as the top five journals. But over time, in the period 1980 to 2000, that influence has steadily declined. And around 2000, it was really at the bottom, which is around 0 0.2. So, uh, so there's a huge decline over the f f roughly 30 years. Um, so that's the first fact. This is true for tier two and it's true for top field journals. The other thing that we have found is that after 2000, there has been a very um, significant recovery in the second tier journals, that is economic journal, um, review of economics and statistics. And indeed, the review of economics and statistics is the journal that has really dramatically recovered. And we'll come back to why that may have been the case. Um, whereas the field journals have more or less stabilized. So they haven't actually declined very much after 2000. So this picture is broadly robust in the sense that you can take a variety of different measures. You can look at page ranks, you can look at fraction of influential papers, uh, and you will see a very similar pattern in the data. So, so it's sort of worth uh, emphasizing that what we see today is not, has not been the case um, all along. It's something that happened uh, probably in the 80s and 90s. And, and things have been actually fairly stable uh, since 2000. In, in terms of the facts on the ground, uh, whether what the deans are doing or what my department is doing may have actually caught up with the data. So, to, so, so we may be slow in catching up so, you know, these journals. So for instance, the Review of Economics and Statistics um, at my faculty is not regarded as being comparable to the top five, although it is actually almost half as influential as a top five paper. Okay, so that's sort of, the profession is a little behind the data, if you like, it's a little out of date. So, so that's really the first sort of, really the big takeaway from um, the data analysis we've done. And um, this is true, as I said, um, it's fairly robust. You can move things around in terms of measures, you can move things around in terms of journals, and you will get a very similar, okay. So I'm not going to, um, you know, talk about um, the page rank. So this gives weight 
uh, if a paper cites me, it gets more weight if it is in turn more cited. So I'm going to skip that. Um, uh, but you see a very similar picture even for that sort of more sophisticated measure. Um, uh, we do a fair bit of work on, um, you know, more sophisticated ways of thinking about the location of journals in the intellectual landscape of the profession. Uh, but let me move on and say a few words about um, an idea that really came from uh, Jim's work uh, with Moktan. And this is an idea that I think is uh, just sort of thinking not about median and averages, but looking more at papers that really matter. So one might say that what we really care about in a discipline, in, a, you know, in science, is papers that really make a difference. So we want to look at very influential papers. And one might ask if very influential papers are, um, you know, are published in a variety of journals, or are they concentrated in a few journals? Has that changed over time? So um, Jim's paper makes the point uh, and that, you know, there's a depending on the field you're looking at, rather important papers are published outside the top five. Okay, so, so we want to look at that a little more systematically and want to look at it over time. So here's the picture. Okay, so what, what, what we've done here is we've, done, we've taken the top five percent, sort of we've looked at, let's look at 1990, and we look at papers that are in the top five percent of papers that are cited. Uh, in terms of citations. And now we look at papers in this set which are published in the different 16 journals that we had. And we want to look at the ratio, just as Glenn did in his earlier paper, in the JP paper, we want to do the same exercise over time. Uh, and what we see is we get a picture which is essentially very similar to the picture we, I had just by looking at impact uh, factor. Okay, so you see that the decline, the secular decline until 2000, and then you see a recovery for the second tier, mostly um, propelled by the review of economics and statistics, and in this case, it happens, you know, a, a gentle decline for the field journals. Okay. Sorry. I would add EJ to that list. Yeah, it, it is added. Yeah, it is there, yeah. So, so this, uh, what we were trying to do is we were trying to understand why is this happening? Uh, why is this happening in economics? Can we come up with a set of fundamental factors that we can measure, uh, which can explain, um, you know, why this is happening? Um, and so the, the paper tries to do this by looking at a model, uh, and the model is a model of journals as platforms. Um, journals compete for good papers, but they have to fill the capacity they have. Authors submit to journals that are widely read. That's a very simple model. Uh, uh, editors choose thresholds. So editors can decide to ask you to work hard or let in your paper without too much work. Uh, they can afford to ask you to work hard if they know that you're willing to work hard. You're willing to work hard to get your paper in if you know that your paper will be widely read. So that's really the um, economics. Okay. And what we see here um, is that when the Depending on the parameters, so there are fields, and within fields there are authors, and um, so this number and size of fields is going to be a critical variable in, in this model. When you have small readership of the general journal, because there are few fields or the fields are small, the unique equilibrium has the field journal being dominant. So it could be a situation in the 70s or early 80s when JET actually dominated for theorists across really, other than econometrica, theorists would not think of submitting to the other general interest journals. Uh, but when the number of fields grows and the size of the fields grow, the general interest journal becomes much more, uh, much, wide, much more widely read. And that allows the editors of the general interest journal to raise standards. They can afford it, they have more market power. That's what drives the emergence of a second equilibrium. And, um, and, and that's really what's the key sort of parameter, the size and the number of fields and the capacity of the journals. And we can take this model to the data and you see very, very clearly uh, the number of published papers, which is also another way of thinking about capacity, but then you see the growth on the right-hand side. You see the enormous growth in the number of papers, uh, especially after 2000 in the number of empirically based papers. And journal capacity, you see very nicely here. You see that 
until 2000, the um, journal capacity in the second tier and the field journals was growing, but after 2000, that has basically stabilized. Okay, and so capacity growth has, has is now favors um, other um, journals. So I'll just wrap up. Uh, we have shown how the dominance of top five emerged over the last 40 years. Uh, we have developed a model to, uh, which identifies key factors, the growth in the number of fields and the size of the fields uh, in explaining the emergence of dominant market position for uh, general interest journals. And I, I think I'll stop, I'm out of time. Yeah, thank you. Next, we have uh, Julia Zakia from the University of Rome, who I must uh, nudge you all towards the INET website because she's had a number of uh, publications and blog posts and so forth and uh, has been very nourishing to our organization. Julia? So thank you so much. And now we just move to uh, the results of uh, evaluation of economic results and uh, economic research and how can impact on a diversity of uh, economics. And first of all, uh, let me clarify what uh, I, um, uh, what I mean uh, uh, with diversity. So diversity for me is uh, a B dimension. So it's made up of heterogeneity of a researcher, so different characteristics, pretty different personal characteristics. So uh, gender, not only a, barrier, a binary uh, dimension, just women and men, but also age and the other uh, personal characteristics such as ethnicity and so on, but also a look at pluralism of research interests and methods and so the diversity of ideas. So this is means that the lack of diversity in the economic professions has a double impact. So both in terms in, of inequality reproduction, but also of lack, and we saw some evidence here, of critical and innovative thinking in economics. One of the, the main uh, consequence of uh, inequality reproduction due to heter less heterogeneity of researchers is a high uh, gender, vertical gender segregation. And here I give you some uh, data, uh, a comparison between uh, Italy and uh, UK uh, about the persistence of this vertical segregation. I use for UK uh, the data by the Women's Committee of uh, the Royal Economic Society. And yes, here we have a good news. I mean, uh, you can see that the share of women at all level increased from 2006 uh, to 2016, but still, women are just uh, less than 20% of uh, a full professor, so at the top of the career. And instead, at the bottom line of the career, among researcher and assistant professor, there are more than 40% of uh, academic staff. Uh, so we have a problem of leaky pipeline. So a dropout of women from uh, economics uh, during the their career path. But looking back uh, with uh, the lack of diversity in terms of uh, personal characteristics in the economics professor has also cultural implications since uh, the professor has uh, a high grade of uh, sexism and we have some evidence also in some paper on that. Uh, for example, Alice Hu, uh, who did a textual analysis on that. But also we have a persistence of uh, manners, so or panels of, with only uh, men and invited where only and the few women that are over there, they are invited just as a token, so just speaking about the gender dimension of the main topic of the panel. So looking instead of uh, the lack of diversity of ideas, the implications are, uh, of course, a high group thinking uh, research that emphasize uh, uh, the macroeconomic and financial crisis that concentrate 
the research and the topics in few in topics with few connections with local and real world problems. And we will see in a minute that there is also a problem of U.S. centrism in uh, economics research. But also one of the main problems is that there is a dominance of uh, economics research in uh, just few elite uh, uh, department. That is something that has been uh, researched a lot, has been analyzed a lot uh, empirically here in UK by Fred Lee uh, from 1992, but also in Italy we have the same problem right now that most of the public funds in economics are going to the same department and the same private uh, university. Uh, so what I did, uh, what I <laughs> tried to analyze with my co-authors that are uh, Marcella Corsi and uh, um, Carlo Di Politi from Sapienza University of Lorme is to find evidence of institutional constraints to diversity in the economic profession. So uh, we just wanted to uh, see which are the implicit and unconscious bias in a research evaluation. So, in a, in a context where there is a change towards uh, a culture of excellence, where there is an increased use of metrics and quantitative indicators on the different aspects of research that are heavily based on the citation and the number of citations of each publication, we just wonder and we just want to know uh, if the standards of excellence for economists in the uh, selection procedures, so for being appointed in the university, imply a lack of diversity, both in terms of inequality reproduction and less diversity of ideas, so less pluralism. So we use Italy as a large experiment. Why? Because uh, from 2012 we have a new uh, public uh, qualification system. So it's a centralized national evaluation system for individuals uh, to be appointed as full and associate professor. That is heavily based on publication. That is heavily ba based on the bibliometrics and citation counts. So we just wanted to identify the joint effect of both both uh, diversity of personal characteristics of researchers and uh, uh, diversity of uh, ideas on the probability of qualifying for promotion to associate a full professors in Italy. So we just concentrate uh, uh, looking at the personal characteristic of research on sex, on gender, on age and academic affiliation. Why? Uh, for the diversity of ideas, so we have three different uh, dimensions. So we have the specialization of the candidate in one of the main, in, in one main topics, and the popularity uh, the, of uh, the research area in the economic community, so looking both at all the publications recorded in Ecolit and uh, on the topics published in the uh, top five journals, and uh, the degree to which they work on peripheral topics. So we, here we have two different measures. If they uh, do work on heterodox uh, uh, themes and with heterodox methods, but also if they are more interested in uh, local economy, uh, such as Italy, or if they are more interested in U.S. economy and not local issues. Um, so which are the main results that we find? So the real constraint to diversity in research evaluation. And here are the results, and just going briefly on uh, the main results is that we find a clear um, uh, evidence of uh, a gender class ceiling. And in fact, the real barrier is that Cedric Paribus uh, being a woman, in Italy has a negative effect on the chances to candidate for the top of the economic professor to full professorship with an average marginal effect of 12 percentage points. So we just wanted to analyze better which is the, re the residual impact of being a woman on the probability of qualifying to associate a full professor in Italy. And we computed for all the and each candidate the difference between uh, her predicted uh, 
probability of qualifying, assuming that she was a man and assuming that she was a woman. So given all the other characteristic, all the other characteristics means all the other personal characteristics, but also all the other characteristics about their productivity and produ academic production. And here is what we uh, have seen. I mean, why for associate professor we don't find any evidence of a real impact of the sex on the um, chances to be promoted. Instead, for full professorship, we have a huge effect. I mean, for uh, people, candidates that have a median probability of uh, qualifying to associate professor, being a woman has a negative effect of more than 20 percentage point. But looking at also the diversity of ideas, we found that uh, specialization, so a concentration of words on the same words of the research, has a positive effect on the probability to and on the chances to qualify to associate professor. And uh, once more, popularity, so researcher and having the same uh, uh, research interests uh, uh, that are more common in the top five journals has a positive effect in, the, in terms of the chances to qualify to full professorship and uh, it increased the probability of almost 17 percentage points. So this is quite an alarming effect, but I just wanted to, con to concentrate right now on the peripherality. So uh, what uh, is the impact of working on local issues and in this case uh, writing about Italy and which is the fact of writing instead about US for a candidate that wants to be promoted to associate in full professorship in Italy. And here is quite uh, um, evident that uh, writing about Italy has a negative effect on the chances to qualify to full professorship in Italy, while instead uh, uh, writing and researching about U.S. and U.S. economy has a uh, positive um, impact both on uh, the chances to qualify as associate professor, but most of all as full professor. So what we can learn uh, from uh, the data and from the analysis of the Italian case uh, where, I mean, we have a national qualification, we have a change towards a culture of excellence based on uh, measuring uh, the quality of research by, by biometrics and citations is that uh, this kind of statistical measure of quality and excellence uh, do produce unequal results. Why? Because for reaching the top of the economic professor or even a tenured professor, it pays to be similar to the majority in terms of gender, in terms of specialization in few research fields, and methods, I will say, for being, uh, I mean, similar, homologated to the most popular uh, themes and research uh, among peers and in few selected top journals. And most of all, it pays to focus on few key economies, on few key, key countries to analyze. And we saw the what is uh, the effect of uh, writing about US. So how we can react to this situation? And I will say, and this is a personal opinion, of course, and we can discuss about after, that we should go towards a responsible and a real responsible research evaluation that accounts for of course, diversity and diversity of our field of research and uh, our subfields in economics, but it also that uh, uh, will account for the social responsibility of uh, the economic discipline and also it implies the role of university in advancing the frontier of knowledge. So here I propose you just uh, a roadmap, I will say, how and for me, which could be the first step to go towards uh, this real responsible research evaluation on single individuals in uh, economics. But first of all, I will think that, I mean, research evaluations should be 
about peer review on unpublished work. They should be blinded, evaluated, and this means that evaluators have more responsibility on their of the evaluations. And this is why I'm mean, looking at more responsibility of uh, evaluators. Also, the committee of evaluators uh, should be representative of diversity in terms of gender, in terms of uh, academic rank, in terms of research subfield orientation and methods. Another thing that I really think is that uh, we cannot uh, judge and evaluate uh, uh, a researcher just uh, looking at uh, publication, but uh, we, should, we should consider all other dimensions, such as also the teaching activities. And this is crucially important if we, uh, if we see the gender dimension, because there is an uh, unfair division of labor, a gender division of labor uh, within the uh, economic department, uh, between the uh, research activities and the teaching and bureaucracy democratic activities, and, but it's crucial also a normative uh, action, so a monitoring uh, action, uh, so there should be created or, or empowered some national and local committee of minorities in the economic professor that should contrast the concentration of public funds in just few economic departments should be the mill the lead one, and they should support uh, pluralism. So, for example, something that is uh, now imposed in uh, Italy that uh, actually the history of economic thought is completely disappearing from the economic department should be I mean, uh, the case uh, looking at diversity and pluralism and uh, a responsible research evaluation. And most of all, I mean, uh, there should be also, I mean, uh, a support for the peripheral topics uh, and so to contrast the US centrism. So, thank you so much. And, I mean, uh, I think that we have some things to discuss. Uh, As uh, an individual who grew up in Detroit, Michigan during the decline of that city and lives in the United States, the idea that the economics profession is getting extra points for studying the U.S. better mean they're correcting problems, but it doesn't seem like we're doing so well imparting things to the rest of the world focusing on the U.S. from my lenses. <laughs> anyway, our first uh, discussant, uh, who works with me at INET in uh, New York is Ursula Constantini. Thank you. Um, so it was uh, quite an interesting panel. Thank you very much for your presentations. Um, what we witnessed to right here was uh, an example of three very different ways of doing economics and re answering to, to the very same two main questions, which are, in my view, uh, what is excellence, what does it mean, and uh, where is economics going, and of course, what, what can we do about it? And one thing I learned here, uh, listening to the presentation, is that uh, I think that we cannot answer those questions unless we drop the idea that papers only differ by degrees of quality. And, uh, uh, you know, it might well be the case that in the top five and even in the second tier journals, papers are somehow similar to one another and also the authors they publish there are somewhat a homogeneous group. But... Um, but if that's the case, that's pr precisely the problem. Where are all the other papers? Where are, or are all the other authors? And so we are left wondering what does it mean, even if there is this uh, shift in impact factor uh, relevance in one uh, group rather than the other. And, uh, you know, that, that's the last fact that uh, Professor Goyal showed us is quite striking, and, and I would like to see that uh, really confirmed and, and strengthened as we discussed previous, before the, the session in terms of uh, 
you know, uh, seeing if the result holds uh, with the diff using different indicators that are present in the literature, like two years impact factor, and so in taking into account the fact that the number of journals included in the data set of Web of Science is actually uh, increasing and creating some distribution effect as well. But more broadly, I think that we cannot just assume away the fact that the very heart of the problem, the fact that there are biases, there is discrimination in economics. And we see that in uh, Zakia's uh, presentation uh, in terms of gender and connections. Uh, in uh, Heckman's uh, presentation, in terms of connections again, and uh, in uh, what he, with strong words, he calls uh, corruption and uh, incest, but I think it's, uh, those are strong words, but quite appropriate in my view. And, but what we also learned here is that even if we use, uh, even if we try and use uh, automatic criteria to evaluate research, those biases and that discrimination does not go away. And that's the case with bibliometric uh, criteria and citation counts. Uh, there we have a lot of research uh, at INET, uh, uh, two wor INET working papers, one by uh, Jakob Capeller and one by Carlo Di Politi that show that actually citations measure a lot of things other than quality and influence. Uh, so uh, those, those uh, criteria actually happen to exacerbate sometimes uh, these uh, biases and discrimination. But that's the case also when you use the principle of authoritas uh, in the case of the top five. So we assign too much power to a handful of editors and uh, to a system that is not supposed to, uh, is not meant for uh, evaluating research as such, but to promote uh, uh, and pursue uh, an editorial project. Um, but there is more, because when we talk about connections, when we talk about, we also talk about networks, and we talk, we talk as a consequence also about approaches, themes of research, sets of ideas. And um, Zakia shows a little bit of that. And the point here is that visibility is a scarce resource, and so we have also an unlimited number of, uh, of um, positions in academia, obviously. And so only some approaches uh, get a share of that uh, visibility. But um, to use a, a metaphor, we can say that only some sets of ideas, some approaches, some networks gets, get a uh, business class window seat, uh, so to speak, in a sense that they can get e more easily seen from outside, they can sit more comfortably, and that is fine because in a plane there are other seats, except that in the plane of economics, uh, only the business class window seats get oxygen, the oxygen mask. So uh, in the end, uh, and this of course reduces the diversity of ideas, and, uh, but that has also an effect on the, this cartel of mainstream views that get the business class window seat because it becomes increasingly self-referential and also the debate within that core of mainstream views is reduced. And that's very clear to the public where, uh, ec by which the, uh, the eco economics appears as a monolith, deaf to so many uh, uh, instances uh, that people bring up in terms of, say, unemployment, inequality, free trade, and so on. And uh, so their economics appears as irrelevant on a very large number of political issues, important political issues uh, for which economics should, be, should have an answer for. Um, so what we have is that in academia, the best students often just go away or uh, they follow the herd, uh, some follow the herd, or some specialize, which there's nothing wrong with that, actually it's a, <laughs> a very legitimate and good choice, uh, of course, but that for sure poses a challenge in terms of how we nourish and reinforce a broad vision of our discipline and of how our discipline interacts with society at large. And um, so, uh, 
what, what can we do about that? I think that for sure what we are doing here is important. There's a process of self-reflection that I hope uh, we can continue in the discussion as well. But I think that it's necessary to uh, recognize also that in a discipline like economics, uh, biases are inevitable to some extent. You know, and a mainstream will always be there. But uh, what we need to do is to reduce the gap, to uh, give some oxygen to the other seats in the plane as well, to reduce the gap between the uh, access that mainstream views have and people who do, main to, who do mainstream uh, research topics and approaches have to funding to access to students, access to some kind of career, so that dissenting is, uh, does not become a self-imposed uh, death sentence and uh, instead we can allow new ideas to develop and maybe get, uh, you know, make their way up. Next, next, we have uh, Marina Deligusta, who uh, I am just getting to know, but another person from the University of Rome who, uh, how would I say, brings, brings Italian muscle to the what? Oh, right. What no, not do. really. No, I'm an exported Italian. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm from the University of Reading, actually. But um, so what I was going to say is actually pick up on something that Susan Athey said uh, at the uh, session in Atlanta on diversity in the profession, which is it's extraordinary how little we use uh, the tools and the findings of our own profession in order to fix it. Um, so I'm just going to pick up on a couple of the things that have been said and a couple of the things that were said at that session um, to basically argue that what we need to fix the leaky pipeline of people and uh, you know in terms of the diversity of in the profession and and that is a very long pipeline that I see in my head as starting from school and the way in which economics is perceived by uh, school kids and whether they then therefore choose or not to study economics and we're doing an awful lot at the RES to actually address that uh, and and you know do more outreach in that sense present the profession in such a way that it reflects really what we do and makes it interesting. Uh, but, and, and that has, of course, one effect at the beginning of the pipeline, all the way up to the top five problem, that in a way, I was actually surprised that, that Professor Hackman wouldn't present as a selection model, because we know all the way there has been a selection up to that point, and just assuming that the top departments will have the best talent, when we know that the education system selects on lots of other characteristics that are not just talent, is a bit disingenuous. Genius, right? Um, so what, what we really need to just do is, is use what we know. So we, we know about bias and, and one of the big, I think, uh, obstacles to us recognizing it is actually in our training. Uh, economists uh, have a lot of training that is all about being objective and our idea of a good paper is that it is going to be about the methods and the internal validity of those methods and whether the data is good and whether the conclusions are good, but basically whether I write it or you write it, if it's a good paper, it's a good paper. Uh, a lot of the other social sciences are a bit more humble about it and they think that there is such a thing as the position of the researcher towards the research and they actually demand the researcher to question why it is that they're interested in that topic, how it is that they came upon those methods rather than other methods and I think that you know that's another stage in the pipeline and by that I mean possibly graduate training where there's a lot that we can do. Well, there's a lot we can do there to address the way in which economists are trained to communicate with the general public and I've said this before and I session we had last year at the RES on, on economics communication, but there's a lot that we can do there in terms of presenting those students with certainly history of economic thought, the idea that actually there isn't just one method in town and they don't just need to be hyper-skilled people at the method that happens to be fashionable right now, that, you know, that they need to be aware that other methods exist and have existed and they can pick and choose. Uh, um, but, but also that we just generally give them the idea that they need to 
worry about their biases because actually it's pretty unscientific not to. I mean, that the fact that we're having a discussion of whether we are not biased, I think if we were in any other audience would make people laugh. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is really something, I think we need to just get over this hangover we have about being very objective uh, because nobody is. And you know, we've, we've been actually very smart about incorporating the better findings that there have been in, in psychology into behavioral economics. We know bias exists, we know it's there. So what are we gonna do about it is the next, uh, is where the game is going next. And obviously there are a lot of very important points in what has been suggested in terms of diversifying editorial boards, in terms of turnover, but there's a lot more we can do in terms of detecting bias. Um, there's, there's by now massive evidence on bias being present in, in letters, in, in referee reports, uh, in all sorts of things. And, and companies know that uh, as well. And they're, you know, they're trying to implement technology that pick up on the bias. They're trying to, uh, you know, there's lots of different evaluation technologies, which is what we started with, that we can actually begin to think about a bit more, not necessarily, not even that creatively, it's actually done <laughs> in lots of other fields, and, and it's certainly done in a lot of um, other institutions, thinking about, you know, how are we going to counter those biases? Why about, how about we start by assuming that they're there, that we all have them, and how, what are we going to do about combating them, which is where we really need to move. And, uh, you know, we know that from, you know, I've been a head of department for three years and I was, you know, on selection panels all the time. Of course, you know that you need to have diversity on, on that board because what you do is basically you have a portfolio of biases there and hopefully they sort of counter each other. And, uh, you know, we need to be serious about the fact that this stuff is happening and that, uh, and that we can actually detect it and we can have technologies to fix it. I, I think, um, you know, the idea that uh, you know, competition is not going to go away, um, REF is not going to go away, Giuseppe will say a lot more about evaluation of research, metrics are not going to go away, uh, but it's a bit disingenuous to think that the number doesn't incorporate biases. I mean, these days, economists have published fantastic research showing how algorithms that go scraping the web are biased, because guess what? Well, they were designed by people. Um, so there are, there are a lot of things that we can do to actually start thinking a bit more creatively about what we know um, and, and apply it to, to ourselves, I think, and to the way the, the profession proceeds. And, uh, and I think a good place to start is to start just accepting that bias is there uh, and not just spend the rest, you know, we don't have another 10 years so to just go and argue whether it's there or not. I really think we should take what the psychologists have done at face value and the fact that unconscious bias is just incorporated in the way human brains think and, and view the world and, and just take the corrective measures that lots of other places use and see which ones work better for us. And, uh, and where actually, you know, for me what's fascinating is trying to find out uh, um, exactly where it is that it matters, right? I mean, does it matter that the, that the letter is shorter for some people or, or uses negative language? Well, maybe not. If it comes out in the wash and there's 10 other letters and, and if the committee anyway assumes that there's going to be bias, maybe they're going to look at something else and it doesn't matter so much. I'm not saying we need to fix everything, but we should at least identify in this pipeline of ideas and people, and ideas, by the way, are incorporated into people, another thing that we have written about, um, is, is actually figuring out at what point does it matter? Where is it that we lose the most of the ideas and of the people and start fixing those points? But I think we have all the tools. We just have to get on with it. Thank you. I would encourage you all to read a, uh, a book in the United States by a man named Jonathan Haidt. It's called The Righteous Mind. And the key chapter in the book is called How the Emotional Tail Wags the Rational Dog, which is a little inversion relative to the uh, kind of models we adopt in economics, but quite germane to, uh, to your comments. Uh, Giuseppe Fontana from University of Leeds can uh, bring it back home to Britain and. Uh, and look, look, at, look at the home team. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert and uh, Ursula, for uh, uh, kindly and generously inviting me to be part of uh, this uh, session. And uh, um, when I first, uh, sorry, when I first Ursula asked me to be part of this uh, uh, panel as a discussant of so many interesting papers, um, I, I was told, uh, uh, please, could you just confront the main 
themes of the session, drawing on your uh, experience, uh, especially in the United Kingdom. And so that's what I did. So basically what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is uh, to talk about the three, I think, drives of this session. And they are the key words, excellence, conformity, and incentive in economics. And I will use as a case study, if you want, uh, uh, a framework program seven European Union project called FESUD, in which I was involved. So in the next few minutes, basically, I will tell what is FESUD and why it matters, I think, for the discussion and how it relates to the work that, the very interesting work has been presented this evening. So FESUD is a pluralistic and multidisciplinary project which aimed to forge alliance across several science in order to understand how finance and financial market can better serve the economic, social, environmental needs of modern society. So basically, it was a project that the European Union uh, um, financed in order to understand what is and uh, what should be the role of finance and financial market in the uh, future. Uh, it started in, at the end of 2011 and finished at the end of 2016 and uh, uh, had a total budget of 8 million euros. So one of the largest social science grants ever given by the European Union. And we had 14 leading university as participants. And in this country, we had the SOAS and University of Leeds uh, that were involved. But there were other university um, um, leading university in Europe. In terms of main output, if you go on the website, you will see uh, fesu.eu, you will see that, uh, among other things, uh, the project produced 207 working papers and over uh, 34 studies in financial, national financial studies. Um, and some of these papers are really very large, above uh, 100 pages. So um, I would say quite large output. In terms of a publication, if you look at the final FESTUD report that we produced at the end of uh, 2016, there were 57 journal papers. So I did a little experiment, and again, connecting to United Kingdom, one of the um, list of journalists that um, many economists working in UK, and especially in business school phase, is called the Association of Business School uh, Journal Ranking, so the ABS. In terms of those um, uh, ranking, basically one is the bottom and four and four star is the top. And so I look where these 57 journal papers uh, have been published. Well, if you look uh, at that list, and I go, again, is a proxy, you know, with all the limitation of any proxy for journal ranking, uh, two papers of, out of the 57 were published in the world leading journals in finance, one in social science, one in innovation. If you go to the lower, so to just below ranking of the ABS three star, seven papers out of 57 were published in social science area, four in economics, two in ethics, one in finance, one in international business, and one in regional studies. Now, why it matters? I go to the question that Ursula and Robert asked me to confront. Excellence, conformity, and incentive in uh, economics. I think a case can be made, uh, starting with FESUD, then during about the, the economics discipline, that FESUD uh, was had some excellence. We got 8 million euros from taxpayer money in, in the European Union. Um, I could go on and say how many a project have been actually built on the FESU project. So I think the case can be made that the FESU was an excellent project. And in fact, this was the words used for assessing our proposal and for assessing uh, the result of the project. In terms of conformity, uh, I think FESU from the beginning was created as a pluralistic and multidisciplinary project. Pluralistic in the sense that different views in economics were given a fair and an equal standing from the SG macroeconomic modeling to Marxist economics, Austrian economics, post-Keynesian economics, and so on. When you look at the publication uh, of the output of that project, uh, you will see that there were zero publication in what, in the ABS list at least, are considered world-leading journals. But there were four publications in what are considered non in economics. So there was in finance, I said, there was in social science, there was in innovation, in world leading journals in those areas. If you go to the uh, tire just below that, there were four um, uh, papers published in the area of economics, in the ABS three star, and 12 in non area of economics. So if I have to 
summarize and confront these three words that I was telling before, excellence, conformity, and incentive. What the lesson I think I learned from Fesso is that, uh, um, and this can be extended, is that uh, to, I think the experience of many economists working in UK, and in particular in business school, we are increasingly, and I'm part of an economist department in a business school, we are increasingly told by our dean, by our uh, university leaders, that we should be engaging in pluralistic and multidisciplinary research. That's also the call made to us as economists by policymakers, by research grant institutions like the SRC. But then when you confront that with the research output that comes from that, you will see that there is, the numbers are there, you can contest, of course, we can discuss these, uh, uh, just a very small example. There is very little chance of that research output being publishing what in a very broad journal ranking list called the ABS, it's considered world leading journals. And I think that's a lesson that could be extended. I can see the previous head of the ref here, Peter, there. Uh, you know, there has been a shrinking of economics uh, department submitting to the ref uh, panel on economic and econometrics. So I think there is a challenge there. On one side, an increasing proportion of economists in this country, at least, are encouraged to do pluralistic and the multidisciplinary project, but when it comes to the publication, and therefore to the incentive, there are, um, I think, a challenge there that we need to confront. There is a very little chance for that research output to be published in world-leading journals in economics. I will stop here. Thank you. We've got uh, a couple of people with microphones, and it's uh, time to Explore your questions. See one straight up the, the beginning in the center on the top uh, section, first row. And if somebody else wants to indicate, yeah. we've got another microphone that can be there. So, should I? Okay. okay. So, Please. thank you for the contributions. Uh, you talked about, I guess, the deficiencies in the established system. I was wondering what exactly is the alternative, right? So, one thing mentioned was open source publications, and I was wondering how exactly you would see that working, because um, I wonder if that would, if, if you see what's happening on social media, um, where everybody has an opinion, everybody has an evaluation. It's unclear that that is, at least that model is the most efficient system, and in the end, it doesn't just matter how many positive, negative opinions you have, but who they come from, which I guess is some of the rationales behind the established journals. So how would this open source, how do you extract information efficiently from the alternative open source model? If you have ideas. Jim, you wanna? Yeah, I, I suggested it, so I will uh, just uh, briefly. The model that I have is something like Archive X in physics. Uh, it's a journal which does require some reference. When people publish, it's not just anybody sending a pot shot. Uh, it's, they have to be introduced in some sense to the system. Oh, yes. So there is a kind of screening on quality, uh, at least initial screening, not per paper, but on the person. So I think you could avoid having a Twitter conversation or you know, Facebook uh, exchange precisely through that. But then there's also reputational. It's, it's influenced strongly by reputation. And this is true also, I think, in biology, right? Some of these open source journals. So there is a precedent. I just think that we have been so conservative. Now the Chernozukov uh, et al. Fudenberg proposal I don't know how far along it really is. I know they're starting it, but it is one proposal in economics. So I just think it's, uh, you, know, you know, for example, when I was the president of the Econometric Society, uh, I suggested that there be open forum on comments on papers published at Econometrica. And it was wild opposition. No, 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 we don't. So the filter plays a very important role. It centralizes power and so forth. But still, you could screen, you could screen. So you want to get rid of extraneous things, pornography and things like that. Nobody, would. but I think there is a self-policing system that's reputationally based that would work, and it does work actually in other fields. 
I'll just quickly, I have a friend who's a very famous author, and I said, what does it feel like to go on Amazon.com and get bombarded? And he said, well, when you get a whole bunch of zeros, you know you wrote a pretty good book. But uh, uh, I don't know that that works. The people at the Public Library of Science have talked about some kind of threshold. First of all, as you said, you've got to say who you are. Yeah. You can't wear a, a code name or something. And secondly, uh, you've you would have to register and be allowed to be a commentator and they would try to create a relatively broad net. In other words, pretty much everybody in the profession. There but you can problem. still see people get gang tackled uh, <coughs> when one coalition doesn't like what another is doing. About 10 years ago, I think there was a Fields medalist in, in mathematics who actually published his paper in Archive X. It never appeared in a refereed journal, but it was viewed as a brilliant piece of work and it was replicated. So I think there is at least some precedent in that. I don't know, what do you think is? Well, I was just going to say that um, I think we, <coughs> we need to, uh, so, so I work with computer scientists and they have a very, very different model of how they sort of, how they screen research and how they disseminate research. Um, and, you know, and, and there has been some discussion. So, so for instance, eco economists, one of the things that many of us here in this room are aware um, is that papers are getting longer and longer, and are, the review times are getting very long. And this is a huge factor for young uh, starting, um, you know, people starting in their career. Um, and, and so the way the computer scientists um, handle this is that they have conference proceedings uh, that, that are, you start and you're basically done with the paper within, max, I think, within a year, but certainly within 18 months. Uh, and, and the conference proceeding is all that matters. It's not quite as finished as an economics paper. It's not quite as long. The literature section is much shorter. Often they may be doing things that, are, that have already been done. Sometimes they're probably doing things that are not quite correct. The proofs may not be quite complete. But I think the way that model works is that if something is truly important, then it, you know, it would be the, 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 the truth and validity would be for, for sure checked and established, and the novelty would also be established. By and large, people are doing derivative normal science work, and that'll, that's fine. We don't need to fuss so much about it. So it's not something that I have thought deeply about, but I know that it's a very different model compared to most leading economics journals. Uh, it seems to have a very different flavor uh, to it. Uh, and, and I know that economists have started the AER Insights, which is supposed to be a bit in that sort of much quicker and so on. But, but that may be a way forward to have many, you know, some more journals like that, which bring out ideas um, in or out and, and very quick turnaround. Uh, I, I, that's the only thing that I've seen formally within the profession. That's been the response. Um, Ursula, did you have a comment? Sorry. Yes, thank you. So uh, I, I actually like the idea uh, of open publishing and I believe there is an effect of self-policing because it does work in this sort of open source environments. I just hope uh, it doesn't become self-censoring in some way just because the authoritarian principle is so strong in economics right now, but it might it might progressively change. Uh, one thing I would like to emphasize is that at the same time, we need change also uh, to happen at the origin in terms of what we teach so that students actually are aware that, that there are other ways uh, uh, to do economics and other, that certain topics can be approached uh, and in what way. And, uh, and also uh, in terms of, uh, of funding, how to, to fund a research, that especially if it's a long-term research and one uh, inter begins. Other questions? Over here, lower right. Thank you. Jan uh, Fidemot, Bruno University. I think part of the problem is uh, that uh, recruitment and uh, promotion decisions are based on essentially looking at someone's CV with a lot of past information and with full disclosure about uh, the candidate's history. It would be, it would be much better if uh, uh, the decisions were based on a sample of research that would be fully blinded. No information about gender, no information where and when they got their PhD, where the paper was published, uh, even better, uh, sample of unpublished research uh, so that uh, the referees or the, the decision makers would consider the, the prospects 
uh, research prospects of that person and not their past performance over their past uh, five or ten years. Mm. Any comments? You're asking departments to think. <laughs> you ask, no, seriously, I think there is, I mean, I, there was, I think, at one point a, uh, maybe, I don't want to create an historical era I didn't live in, but I do think that, that, uh, that there was probably more reading generally. I'm not saying there's no reading in profession. There's some departments, some committees that are renowned for that. But I do think there is an information problem and a specialization problem too, right? You have a lot of people and mm -hmm. looking at fields they don't know anything about. They say, well, he got a top five in uh, the AER and you know, this shape and that and kind of metrica that somebody liked it, so why shouldn't I? I mean, it, but it is, I mean, you know, time is scarce, and I think people are anxious to, to use these signals. They're flawed. I think we should make sure they know they're flawed. But these are really important decisions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Time yeah. is scarce, but, uh, yeah, the impact of these decisions is huge. So I think one has to be very, um, um, I think certainly my own experience um, uh, with hiring is that I think certainly my department, uh, and I think it's true in other places as far as I'm aware, invest an enormous amount in understanding whether this person is going to be a good colleague. An enormous amount. CVs matter, but CVs are essentially quite comparable. So anonymity is going to be very hard. I mean, I don't know how it is where you're working, but certainly in the places I've worked or I'm you know, I'm engaged with, people invest hugely in figuring out whether this is a good person for the faculty, mm -hmm. you know, whether this person is going to fit with the culture of the faculty. Um, not just their intellectual somehow, you know. Um, and, and I think... But wait, there are a lot of schools that have a top five order. I mean, I know plenty of students who say, I have to have a certain number of top fives, period. That's the rule. And it varies from country to country and you know, department to department, in, uh, but it definitely there are these autumn. Sure. So Cambridge sounds ideal. So you have a good faculty, and I congratulate you, but I think it's the exception. No, 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 I think I was not, no, 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 not at all. I was actually, I have all along maintained that, you know, I got into this uh, project because I was so dismayed by the bean counting yeah. in Cambridge. But I was saying within that set of people who meet the bean counting criteria, there is a lot of investment in learning about the person you're trying to hire. And so anonymity would... That can would, be the second stage. Yes, yeah. but that is, yeah. yes. It is yeah. at the second stage, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah maybe but the first... Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I mean, again, the first stage is often 600 candidates. We yeah. invest masses of time on five people. Yes. Just to say, if we're going to take a pipeline approach. Um, and and we, we train in unconscious bias, of course, if you're in sitting or an interviewing panel. But in terms of selection committee, there's no such requirement. So when we see through the 600 to get to the five, it, it could just be, you know, the five guys that do that kind of research, and I'm afraid they might be all guys. But wouldn't you so, think this take also takes place at the graduate student admission yeah. level? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the emphasis yeah. on the GRE, even though we know it has low predictive power, it's un mindlessly used yes. to filter. So yes. the 600 remind me more of like yeah. the number of students applying to a, a major research university. Yeah. So the filtering process, it's not just the top five. There's just these signals aren't aren't so hot. Yes. Look, other questions. If not, I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts. The first is the. There's one. The, one, there's one there. Oh, got one. Oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. He does Eric the work and he gets the reward. All right. Um, Eric Tekan, the graduate student from the University of Warwick. Um, um, I myself have a question in terms of how um, the impact of reaching the top of um, the academic profession, which is full professorship, in, uh, and in terms of um, publicizing or, cro um, or publishing papers, which cross-reference um, sort of um, in terms of, uh, of same gender, the same people with the same gender, the same subspecializations um, in the field of economics especially, um, and um, the same school of economic thought, if you like, um, sort of like what impact 
past that uh, sort of like on tennis itself. Thank you. Uh, I, I do feel that this is part of the authority structure in the, so I think it, you have to, to, to signal that you're working in a field that's respected. You often cite people who have credibility within a certain system. So I think there is a lot of self-perpetuation uh, built into the system. Um, uh, I mean, I, I do, I mean, just sort of speaking a little more generally, I mean, I do feel that it would help, I think, to have um, sort of authority figures or, you know, dominant sort of journals based outside a few uh, key faculties. I mean, after all, this is a discipline which is, I mean, one reason we are debating this is that this is a subject which is enormously popular with students. It's enormously popular in terms of faculties, you know, all over the world. So it's only natural that there should be, you know, dominant sort of powerful reliable, reputable schools outside a few dominant schools. You know. So in some sense, I think that would make a, that would help, I think. Uh, make it less, the market power aspect, conformism aspect, less problematic, I think. Well, and they just, I mean, somebody mentioned economic history. I mean, trying to publish a paper, especially in the history of economic thought, I mean, there are just very few major journals that we would consider it. And referees would say, this doesn't fit into the journal uh, you know, history. We don't do that. And economic history suffers same. frequently from the same problem. And economic historians write books. And you can see what the, what the, uh, the people I interviewed thought about books. You know, it's just uh, way down on the totem pole. So I think, uh, I think there is a sense that this process is filtering. It's, you write a nice, crisp article, people understand and you can make a few graphs and really get a punchy point. That's going to be much better than a complicated argument that involves lots of data, lots of insight, maybe uses non-economic arguments in conjunction with economic arguments. I think that's, uh, I think that's a tough for the re some of the referees, too. And so the question is, how do we get out? Rob, what do you think? How do we get out there and actually allow people, allow this kind of work to flourish? Mm. Uh, that's, a, that's a big order. <laughs> oh, uh, please. Okay. I'll come back to, I'll come so, back to that, yeah. I'm Sultan, a graduate student from University of Paris. And uh, uh, so my question is, so one, uh, one theme coming out of the panel is that you should consider more diversity of ideas, you should consider bo more books. Political science has this kind of thing. They don't worry about causality as much as we do. They, they worry about, uh, they, they have much more books coming out there. Like Are they really better off? Um, do we, should we learn from them? What does the panel think about that? Any, any comments? Yes, I think that uh, we have the same problem also within economics because uh, actually I used also to uh, write about once more history of economic thought and I have the same problem. I mean, uh, there are few uh, journals that publish, uh, there are few top journals that publish this uh, kind of, uh, I mean, field of research in economics and most of all, I mean, we do research on, and we, we do publish on chapters in books and in uh, books, and this is not evaluated. So maybe we have, I mean, for co of course, to change, I mean, the way of uh, we look at different fields and all the connection of different fields. I think that, uh, I mean, interdisciplinarity also should count uh, on uh, evaluation and uh, is a plus. But it would but be lacking for many of the peer reviewers. <laughs> they couldn't read a lot of yeah. these papers. They just didn't know what these guys were talking about. Don't you think? So I'm mean, just thinking, go out to the normal scientist in the profession. They might be overwhelmed by hearing about Durkheim, I heard earlier today, and a lot of these other people from other social sciences. It's not a common part of the curriculum anywhere, as far as I know, to teach broadly.
I mean, Schumpeter's book, you know, The History of Economic Thought, mm. was totally different curriculum. And mm. it, economics in the 1930s was taught along those lines. Mm. You know, Milton Friedman's price theory text at Columbia by, by Wesley Clare Mitchell was a history of thought. Mm. It was like literally a series of examples of bad ideas that had gotten perfected and then how, how we got to where we were. And it, it's, that style just vanished. Mm. It became very much the uh, examination of a kind of a model of physics and you know, theorem proof and yeah. literally that other style just vanished. So Thorstein Veblen's long gone mm. <laughs> and uh, many of these others. So you can lament that, but I think the internal, the internal sources are really not that powerful. I don't know if I could add um, something. Yes, that's very interesting. We had the pre-preparatory meeting and uh, with Professor Ekman, we discussed some of these ideas. And uh, what I found very interesting is that it was at one point we discussed also policymakers. And I think um, there is an issue here how um, economics and uh, economics advice are perceived by policymaker. And uh, I don't think, you know, Robert was mentioning before um, that's not the highest point uh, for our discipline. A lot of policymakers are either abandoning uh, or refusing, in a sense, to engage with economic advice. And I think it's very important what Robert was saying. We have to confront ourselves with issues. So a lot of policymakers, you know, we live in this country, the Minister of Education told us that economists were useless. Who will listen anymore to the economist? So there is an issue here is that uh, at least there is a perception, I know there is a discu discussion later on in this uh, conference about uh, the message but, um, and the communication of the message. I think it's very important that we do confront the fact that uh, policymakers ask economists to engage with real world issues, uh, drawing on or engaging with other um, discipline and it looks like at least that uh, the major, the world leading journals, they are not interested in that. And as long as that's the case, then there is a, a tension, uh, and in particular the incentive, you know, uh, how young people will follow the demand of a policymaker, the demand of research grant institution, when they know that there will be problem in promotion and in career. I think that's some things we need to do to discuss and face. Yeah, but I think, I, I, I don't want to go overboard on this, but I do think among a lot of economists, there's pessimism about what economics can actually do. <laughs> and their purpose in life is to get a job, have kids, have a home, get tenure, and go through the trap. I honestly think that is a widespread mentality. So then I remember the survey that was taken like 20 years ago, wasn't it? Asking graduate students what was most important. Was knowledge of the economy important? It was way down on the list. Many other things are more important. So, I mean... So I think the issue may be deeper than just some journal policy. You have, to, you have to send the journals different papers, maybe, and maybe have a different composition. That was uh, Professor Collender? Collender. Yeah, yeah, Collender. Mm. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, that, was, that was quite a, he was a professor in Vermont. Yeah. And he and Bob so. Solo had a lot of discussion. Bob Solo was my undergraduate advisor. Oh, right. And I remember hearing from Bob about a lot of the thoughts, but it, the punchline was, 87% said you have to know about math, 78% you had to know about statistics, 13% said you had to know anything about the economy mm. to, su to succeed in the profession. And, uh, well, I think, uh, I think we probably should tie it up because there's a cocktail party beckoning for all of you. I'll, I'll leave you with about three thoughts. The one, in coming here to the UK today, I, I reflected on the fact that INET started just over 10 years ago, and the person who was probably closest at my side in exploring what to do was a gentleman at LSC who I'd worked with quite a lot. Probably I've worked with him more than any other British economist. His name is Charles Goodhart. And after Charles was uh, quite advanced in his career and had worked a good deal of time at the Bank of England, they created something, I guess in his name, I guess he kind of said it, but a woman named Marilyn Strathern paraphrased it. And it was, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And I think what we've embarked on exploring here 
is a, is a healthy yearning to find quality, to find better people in the profession, but we're off course. And I think when you ask what do you do when you're off course, is you have to explore. But the nature of exploration at this time is very difficult. And Marina, your allusion to uh, unconscious bias, just using that phrase, and by the way, my, my wife teaches, her profession is to teach healing of racial animosity using these mind science uh, of unconscious bias. Unconscious bias is unconscious. So when you accuse someone of being a racist or a sexist, they don't get it. And they become defensive. And it makes things worse. Now why am I saying that? Why am I taking that detour? Because it's my view that a lot of people purify their identity by distancing from what they see that makes them uncomfortable. But you can purify your identity, be venomous, put people on the defensive and heal nothing and make the world worse. And you can be very self-righteous about it. And I think what we're all being asked to do, particularly in the advanced countries right now, is to dig a little bit deeper. And I'll, uh, I'll finish with a quote that comes from a bumper sticker I found in Northern California last summer. It says, resentment is like taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. There is no basis for hostility and resentment, but there's every reason in the world to be digging deep right now because the economics profession is very far off course. Thank you all and thank you for being here.